Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ashley Stolzman, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog, and I'm going to call to order our meeting for Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021 of the Dr. Cog Board Work Session. The meeting's being um, recorded, and uh, because of COVID-19, we're not meeting in person, we're meeting electronically. So I call the meeting to order, and the first order of business this afternoon is public comment. So I would request that there are no public comments on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. Any members of the public that would care to provide comments will have three minutes to tell us what they'd like to tell us. We will open the phone lines now and unmute everyone and ask if there are any members of the public that would care to comment this afternoon. Just a second while I do this. So if there are any members of the public that would care to comment, please comment. Thank you. Seeing that, that'll take us to our next uh, order of business this afternoon, um, which is that there is a summary of the December 2nd um, board work session in your packet it is attachment A. So we will accept the summary of the December 2nd board work session, which takes us to our next order of business this afternoon, which is the proposed approach for the 2021 Metro Vision Amendment process. Brad Calvert, our Director of Regional Planning and Development, is going to take us through a pres presentation this afternoon. Brad? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm hoping folks can hear me. Is that, is that now, okay? we, now we can. Sorry, I had accidentally muted everyone. And let me do a little bit of screen stuff on my end here. Um, let's see. Well, I've I was gonna try something that's not working on my end, but I'll go ahead and and, and roll with it. Uh, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good 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 afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Brad Calvert. I am the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, here at, at Dr. Cog. Um, I am going to just quickly sort of run through um, about 12 slides here that are really about uh, making sure that uh, we are um, uh, properly set up for a conversation related to a MetroVision uh, plan amendment in 2021. Um, you probably uh, made the link between this item and the item that I believe Jacob and Alvin, Alvin will cover. Uh, we have a long history of uh, Dr. Cog of, of, of um, thinking about uh, the MetroVision plan and the regional transportation plan uh, together as key foundational planning documents uh, for Dr. Cog. So there's definitely a connection uh, between uh, these two items in many ways. Uh, as the RTP uh, approaches the finish line, uh, staff is thinking that there is a conversation to be had uh, related to the, Met the MetroVision plan uh, as well. Um, so a quick sort of overview of today's discussion. Um, really, we are gonna kind of preview an overall approach uh, for preparing a proposed amendment to the MetroVision plan for board consideration. Uh, and really we're seeking some early input uh, from, from the board that would help us finalize that approach. Uh, you'll sort of pick up a little bit later that um, a, a fair amount of our sort of request today is, a, is a, about a very sort of, in, in, to, in the staff's perspective, kind of an important. Brad, uh, early, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. I want to take a question because there's a hand raised from a member just to make sure there aren't technical issues. And I also want to let you know that we cannot see any slides yet. You cannot see slides at the moment? Yeah, Correct. Brad, I have blank white. Brad, I have um, your slides pulled up if you want me to just drive. Uh, let's try this again. So, while you look at that, I'm going to go over to Director Atchison, who has his hand up. Director Atchison? Uh, you caught it. I was trying to get a word to Brad that all we have is a blank screen. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you for letting us know. Um. So. Hmm. Still blank, I assume? Now it is. Yeah, it, we could see them for a moment. That's very odd. Yeah, Brad, you can either run through, because we can see that screen, the yeah. PowerPoint screen. So you could either yeah. run through them there or I can run it for you. Why don't you run it for me, Lisa? That'd be great. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulty. We yeah, tested right. it just before the meeting started and it worked perfectly. <laughs> All right. Can you see that, Brad? Yeah, uh, go back one slide, please. 
Um, just to make sure I had finished that thought. Um, uh, so I, I pretty much got there, but but in general, um, as mentioned, we're really sort of focused on kind of a, an overall approach as well as kind of a key uh, milestone that I'll describe here in a second. Next slide, please. Um, I do want to kind of give you a, just a quick, for folk, particularly for folks that maybe um, weren't as uh, on the board uh, during uh, the time that we were developing the Metro Vision Plan, I do want to kind of give you a quick sort of recap of, of the uh, six-year effort to develop the current Metro Vision Plan. I'll sort of parse this a little bit and provide a little bit more detail uh, in the next slide, um, but it, it was a six-year process uh, to develop uh, the current Metro Vision Plan uh, that was adopted by the board in January of 2017. Um, with a few minor amendments uh, in both 2018 and 2019, um, kind of div divided into two types of amendments. There are staff initiated uh, amendments that typically are related to performance measures and targets, and then sponsor initiated uh, amendments where we're ultimately um, uh, compiling and collecting and putting in front of the board uh, amendments as, as proposed by, in this case, local governments, uh, very specifically related to uh, urban centers, both new urban centers recognized in the plan, as well as adjustments to urban center uh, boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as, as noted, um, I'll kind of maybe give a little bit sort of more detail uh, to a couple key milestones that are really in some ways sort of the motivation behind kind of the suggestion for, for doing a pretty significant amendment uh, this year. Uh, the slide points out some import, important plan development milestones in kind of the 2015-2016 timeframe, and I'll cover that here in a second. Uh, but again, for folks that maybe weren't uh, on the board at the time, the board was also very engaged, uh, particularly in 2013 and 2014, um, in the Metrovision plan development uh, in terms of both regular briefings as well as there were two ad hoc uh, board committees that were formed very specifically uh, to help staff uh, through the process of drafting uh, plan content. Um, so to kind of then kind of cover what's on the slide, uh, that really culminated with um, at, at the board workshop that was held in February of 2015. Um, the, the board really began uh, sort of the process to sort of formally deliberate uh, on that draft Metro Vision plan and spent, as you can see on the slide, the next, I don't know, 18 months uh, going through uh, that deliberation uh, process, finalizing the version that was ultimately released for public review as noted on the slide in September of 2016. What all that means uh, is that in practical reality, uh, sort of what I, you know, I refer to as the external information flow uh, to the plan uh, really ceased uh, really in late 2014 or in early 2015 as, as staff was working uh, with the board to, to ultimately get to a, a version that the board could work on uh, as, as a body. Next slide, please. Um, so as I noted earlier, um, sort of that relationship between the Metro Vision Plan and the Regional Transportation Plan has been longstanding, um, really since the, the since the Metro Vision Plan was originally adopted by the board in 1997. That has been sort of a key uh, part of our work to make sure there is significant alignment between these two foundational uh, plans for the region. Uh, in fact, it's relatively common for these plans to be sort of assessed and amended. Uh, through aligned efforts um, or alternatively to sort of pause uh, formal invitations to stakeholders in the public to submit amendments. Uh, and in fact, that's that's what happened uh, in the past year um, as, as uh, the region was working on the regional transportation plan. It really made a lot of sense to not unnecessarily initiate an amendment process uh, for the Metrovision plan until such time as the RTP was, was, was wrapped up. Uh, so now that we are um, sort of getting to the finish line, and I hope Jacob and Alvin both feel like they're getting close to the finish line, um, we can start thinking about opportunities to optimize uh, that alignment uh, between those two plans. Um, but as noted on the slide, uh, the RTP isn't the only sort of indicator that we notice in the region that our planning landscape uh, has changed over the past five years or so. Uh, there have been a lot of state and regional activities uh, that may be appropriate to consider uh, in a process to align MetroVision. Uh, with the work of key partners that have pursued plans and initiatives that advance the board priorities that are outlined uh, in the Metro Vision Plan. Those are sort of shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Quick rundown of a few of these. Um, you know, we spent a fair amount of time with the board the last two quarters of 2020 uh, sharing what we were describing as this gap analysis, um, sort of the gaps between the aspirations noted in the Metro Vision Plan and the region's collective assumptions about growth and development uh, that were formulated as part of the small area forecast work uh, developed in support of that regional transportation plan. 
the state has been working in a whole series of plans, targets, and resources to ensure a more sustainable and resilient future for both uh, the state of Colorado as well as um, our region. And also uh, our partners at the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce and the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation launched an important initiative noted on the slide as Prosper Colorado uh, to bring the public, private, and nonprofit sectors together to identify, uh, understand, and eliminate uh, barriers to opportunity uh, in our region and state. So clearly a lot has happened, uh, and these are just a few examples in the last five years or so. Next slide, please. So a little bit of kind of what staff's been up to um, prior to kind of coming uh, to you all this afternoon, um, really just working on some preliminary tasks to, to help us better understand and, and scope what an amendment might look like. Uh, as, as, as noted uh, previously, this afternoon's conversation is obviously an important check-in uh, for us. Uh, so we have been reviewing those key inputs that I kind of uh, glossed over uh, previously just to understand uh, what, what, what's in, what, what the sort of intent of those uh, programs have been and how they might ultimately inform uh, staff-initiated amendments. We've been thinking through what a schedule might look like based on a few key issues. Uh, really, the, the 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 process to have the public review and the board uh, presumably adopt uh, the regional transportation plan. Uh, we want to make sure that stakeholders are not confused and that we aren't sending uh, a confusing message. Uh, we do firmly believe that every Metro Vision Amendment process is a process that we are co-developing and co-designing with the board. So we want to make sure we have opportunities to engage the board. And then, as I mentioned previously, just making sure we have a sense of, of how to best engage uh, the public and other stakeholders uh, in this process. Next slide, please. Uh, so as, as I sort of, I think I failed to mention it um, earlier during the sort of technical difficulties, uh, one of the things that was really important to the board uh, in the last process to develop the, Met the MetroVision plan was finding alignment uh, between the plan and Dr. Cog's overall approach to, to organizational strategy. Uh, and that's represented uh, by that blue triangle uh, that you see uh, on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, really, the MetroVision plan picks up uh, that organizational strategy work at the altitude that you see uh, in that triangle, sort of referred to as overarching themes uh, and outcomes, um, and, you know, and works all the way down uh, that organizational strategy all the way to strategic initiatives. Uh, and those are noted in, in the plan as specific and voluntary opportunities for local and regional organizations to contribute to MetroVision outcomes, the board's outcomes established uh, in the plan. Uh, what I really want to use this slide for is to just kind of maybe sort of point the board to what we presume as staff uh, is the most likely uh, set of amendments that we would ultimately be bringing forward uh, to you are more likely to be at the lower, from a volume standpoint, be at the lower end of that altitude, really focused on the strategic initiatives side of things just simply to make sure that we are reflecting how and in what way those aligned efforts will make progress towards their goals and ultimately the shared goals uh, in the MetroVision plan. Uh, but uh, there, there may be some uh, amendments that come forward that are really about plan organization. Uh, and that's sort of pointed to at that sort of overarching theme and outcome and objective level. Uh, as we take a step back and think of how the plan is organized, particularly sort of for bringing new content uh, into uh, the plan that might suggest that there would be some readability and organizational improvements uh, the staff may suggest uh, along the way as, as well. So it's not to say that there won't be those types of amendments, but it, it, they will largely be, again, sort of maybe making sure that the plan is organized in a way that's consumable uh, and readily um, understandable by, by the public, uh, though there will probably be more um, uh, amendments that might be more that initiative level. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a few examples uh, for context um, so that maybe this is making this lands a little bit easier on on, on folks. Um, the, the examples on the slide are really just that they're examples uh, as noted the sort of the broader context that comes with viewing the entire uh, Metro Vision plan will really inform how staff uh, curates and brings forward uh, suggestions for the board. Uh, my hope in this slide is just to kind of give you a sense of how we might translate uh, these regional priorities into components uh, that work uh, within the context of the MetroVision plan. So, for instance, on the RTB side of, side of things, the, the left-hand side of the slide, uh, you may recall that in December, the board received a briefing on federally required performance targets uh, for infrastructure condition 
and at the, during that same conversation provided guidance to staff uh, related to measures and targets uh, for traffic fatalities and serious injuries uh, in the region. Your feedback uh, in, in December as well as uh, sort of the recent and ongoing uh, Regional Vision Zero efforts uh, will inform uh, new Metro Vision measures and targets the board will consider uh, during the amendment process. Uh, additionally, the plan uh, can and probably should be amended to reflect uh, the region's shared uh, multimodal transportation planning priorities that are identified in the RTP, uh, including the many uh, programs and initiatives pursued uh, in service to the shared mobility future that's outlined uh, in that plan. Uh, and then sort of transition to the right-hand side of the slide, a kind of quick example, uh, the Chambers Prosper Colorado effort uh, very much aligns uh, with the MetroVision theme of a vibrant regional economy. Uh, and the Chamber's work, uh, they, their, diverse, their diverse partners have identified a series of regional goals uh, that can inform uh, supporting objectives identified in this theme uh, in, in the MetroVision plan. You can see a few examples uh, on the slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's sort of a primary question uh, on this slide, and I kind of I will break that question down into some sub questions uh, to kind of frame the discussion in a little bit. Um, but uh, just to kind of just remind you, uh, key steps uh, as noted, uh, staff always views uh, our process to bring forward what we call staff initiated amendments as something that is a shared. Uh, activity uh, with, with the board. Uh, we always co-develop um, sort of options related to adjustments to performance measures uh, and targets. Uh, noted in the sort of second bullet, uh, any process to adopt the, uh, update the plan will include an opportunity for stakeholders and the public to suggest amendments. Uh, our internal terminology is that sort of sponsor initiated amendments term that you see on the slide. Uh, additionally, uh, all efforts to amend the MetroVision plan are publicly noticed and include uh, a public hearing. So the, the note that you see on the slide uh, in the orange text is sort of the, the, the crux of what we're looking for feedback on quickly in sort of today's conversation. Uh, at this point in time, staff's goal is to reflect the important work of these planning partners uh, in the proposed amendments and staff would like to prepare, we think it would be beneficial to prepare a sort of marked up or redlined uh, version of the plan prior to the initiation or solicitation of those stakeholder and sponsor initiated amendments. Uh, we're suggesting that because we'd like to acknowledge the importance of the aligned uh, efforts uh, early in the process versus asking or hoping uh, those planning partners um, sort of are able to repackage their priorities in a way that's consistent uh, with MetroVision and Dr. Cog's organizational strategy work, we, we, we understand that pretty well and can, can play that, that, that role of translating uh, other regional priorities uh, to our strategic uh, planning framework. Uh, so really we're hoping to save time and effort from, re from the perspective of regional partners by, by approaching it uh, this way. So as noted on the, on the slide, kind of the ultimate question is how we get there. And uh, as I mentioned, I'll sort of break that up here as we get into discussion here in a second. Um, next slide, please. So if we can just pause here for one second and take a few questions that have come up. Our first question is from Director Atchison. Hey, Brad, if, if you're looking at the goals and objectives that we had already established, how many of those do we need to revisit based upon the impacts of last year? And a lot of that continuing so far into 2021. Um, well, I guess my, my first response to that is um, I think that's a conversation for the board. Um, you know, our our hope here is that uh, the MetroVision plan, because it is describing a desired future state, you know, it is looking out into the future and says, you know, in the future, this is the place that we want this region to be. And these are the key um, outcomes that describe that end state um, that, you know, this, this, despite sort of the challenging times of the last sort of year or more, uh, those outcome statements remain relatively evergreen and there still is a commitment to the board that, that is the desired future. Uh, if, if we get into this process and, and the board feels like there is a very real conversation to be had about uh, adjusting those outcomes, that's certainly on the table. Um, I was sort of, I didn't say this, but I was sort of alluding to it. Uh, the higher up we you go uh, related to that um, uh, triangle, 
so when you get into sort of the outcome level uh, elements of the plan, staff use those as pre pretty difficult to change. Uh, those are things that the board spent, I mean, you were part of that conversation, many, many, many conversations uh, working on together. Uh, and so we, we, we tend to think those things as, as, as being something that are really um, fully within the sort of purview of the board to, to suggest that maybe they are not adequately describing uh, the shared and collective uh, future uh, that the region is working toward. Um, so I, I don't know if I got exactly to your to your answer, but but in general, you know, I, I think when you are in the world of sort of long range uh, vision and planning, uh, you hope that short term disruptions don't necessarily change uh, where you're trying to get in the future. I guess my own response is, what do you consider short term disruption? <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, that's, that, that's a fair point. <laughs> okay, Thank thanks. You. Thank you, Director Asherson. Any other questions? So the presentation at this point. All right, seeing none, Brad, if you could take it away. Yep, uh, so next slide. Uh, so this is, this is totally an ambitious schedule and I'm, I'm mostly just using it to kind of sort of walk you through what, what these steps might, might look like. Um, you know, what, what we think is probably the best approach here is, um, and this would, uh, really kind of maybe the, the March example shown here would ultimately give uh, an opportunity for the conversation that, that Director Atchison was bringing forward as well. But but we would share in general as staff um, uh, the changes that we, we may suggest um, at the sort of the outcome and objective altitude. Uh, as noted previously, that most likely is going to be related to sort of any organizational uh, changes to make sure the plan hangs together uh, in the right way. Um, so that does feel like the first conversation that we should have, and that might be an opportunity to have the conversation that, that Director Ashes and I were just having. Uh, that feels like the first step, uh, and the next step is really, the, and then to sort of reflect on uh, to what degree should we, the board, uh, be thinking through uh, adjustments to performance measures and targets uh, in the plan. Um, so for instance, you know, there, there that, that is an important conversation because we are the board is working towards an adoption of a regional transportation plan uh, that extends out to, to 2050. Uh, our current set of targets are oriented towards uh, 2040. So that, that fact alone uh, warrants a, a pretty real conversation about how to make adjustments uh, to those measures uh, and targets. And then sort of that last piece, again, very aggressive and ambitious schedule that I'm not even suggesting is really in the realm of the possible is this notion of, of working towards an action from the board of directors that releases that marked up draft uh, of the plan and initiates those spo sponsor, uh, that sponsor initiated amendment process. Uh, it's, it's unusual for the board to take action to release uh, a draft um, during a typical amendment cycle. That really only happens during kind of a major uh, update process. So that would be a, a unique step uh, that staff is suggesting as part of, that, of this amendment process. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, this kind of breaks that how do we get there question into really the questions that are on staff's mind um, at this time, but clearly this conversation should go uh, in the direction that it needs to go to, 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 to help us as staff and to help you as directors uh, understand how to best navigate uh, this process. Um, so in the, the short version of the questions that were really, or as I mentioned, are on our mind is, um, are you comfortable as a board uh, with staff proposing amendments uh, based on our own review of those aligned regional efforts that I mentioned earlier? Um, if so, uh, what degree of documentation is, is helpful to you to, to understand sort of the rationale that staff is using to suggest a potential amendment uh, to the plan? And, and that sort of last bullet, uh, do you agree with our recommendation uh, to prepare uh, sort of a marked up draft uh, that's sort of endorsed by the board or released by the board uh, prior to opening uh, the call for sponsor initiated amendments, which as I mentioned is, is always a part of the process to amend the Metro Vision Plan. So again, happy for those questions to be prompts, but, but, but happy to hear other feedback um, as well. And so with that, I'll turn it back to the chair and see if there's any questions and how we can have the best version of a conversation uh, to get you all uh, oriented towards uh, this potential upcoming project. 
Thank you. So we will have discussion now on the amendment process for Metro Vision. We have a few people in the queue, but I'd love to see all those hands up. Normally, this would be a big discussion around the board. So in the queue now, we have Director Teal, Director Levy, and Director Brackett, but I'm looking forward to seeing everyone else's hands come up. So Director Teal. Why, thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. Um, uh, so Brad, when we talk about, you know, we, you talk about the objectives and the uh, outcomes, I mean, I remember those being really pretty <laughs> good, long, detailed conversations with a whole lot of wordsmithing um, back during the uh, the MVIC days. Um, I mean, Brad, could we see, you know, uh, is it the thoughts that what you'd bring forward to the board for the work session would be, uh, this is what it is, this is what staff suggests. Can we see that side by side? Is that kind of what you're thinking of or? What, what are your thoughts? Can you paint that picture for us? Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll maybe sort of reflect on the, the sort of the slide that kind of broke it into kind of two uh, pieces. Uh, there is sort of a plan organization conversation uh, that really is at that outcome and objective level. And, and Director Teal, you were sort of getting at what I was alluding to previously. The board spent a lot of time on those words. And the, the, the words at, at the particularly the outcome level um, I think mean a lot to the board. Uh, and so I don't foresee staff bringing forward something that's like a series of red line suggestions that you know could be taken as the board didn't quite get this right. This is how staff would suggest it. That, that's certainly not the approach that we wanna take. Uh, our primary focus is going to be really trying to reflect that initiative level uh, activity that partners around the region are, are have committed to working on because they've gone through their own process over the last five years and we simply want to reflect uh, the reality of those aligned efforts that are ultimately moving the region towards uh, the outcomes that the, that the board adopted um, so that's in, in many ways what you would see in March is something like more of a um, outline uh, from staff suggesting these are how these parts would move around, uh, less this, these are how these parts should change. Okay. Um, could we also see, you know, in terms of the, um, the uh, and, and make, make sure I'm looking at this right, if I'm trying to remember Jerry's coaching as we were going through all that, but can we see with these outcomes, some of the performance measures on how they've been tracked as well? Yes, and so in, in fact, the board's actually, uh, you will see in February, uh, the February regular board meeting, uh, we, we annually uh, provide uh, updates for uh, plan performance measures. Uh, so that'll actually be in your packet in February, uh, but ha happy to have that conversation as well. Cool, okay, thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Director Teal. So in uh, at that now we have Director Levy and then on deck Brockett and in the hole we have Director Gip. Director Levy. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, greetings. <laughs> nice to be here with you all. On, on your second uh, bullet point on the degree of documentation that we would like to see, um, what I think what what I would appreciate, but, you know, maybe it's me being new to this process, but is something that would be a crosswalk sort of of um, here's here's the regional plan um, that staff reviewed or took a um, an amendment from, and here's how it is showing up in the proposal. So we know, um, you know, what what is in there and where did it come from and then have a chance at the same time to be seeing, well, what's not in there. Um, so just, you know, being able to really uh, have that, that crosswalk that shows how the regional plans were inputted. And just, to, just that, that, that very much works for staff. Uh, I've got a skilled team that is very used to doing crosswalks. Uh, so I, I think that's very much sort of how we were thinking we would approach sort of disseminating uh, information to the board so that you can sort of track uh, sort of where, where we are in terms of the suggestions that we're making. Great, thanks. Thank you, Director Levy. Next, we have Director Brockett. Yeah, Brad, thanks so much uh, for that presentation and, and I appreciate you all undertaking this. It has been a good number of years and um, 
if nothing else, like you say, the fact that the RTP is going to 2050 is a, is a great reason to revisit this. So I'm glad you're doing this, definitely comfortable with it. Um, I'll agree, agree with Director Levy about the required documentation. I think having that, um, looking back to what um, regional efforts and what plans have changed and why we're suggesting uh, the changes that we are based on those with a little documentation would be extremely helpful. Um, and I do think it's a good idea to have essentially an internal round like you're proposing um, that we consider before we then turn you know, to the, the sponsors. I think that's a great idea. Let's start with what we think as an organization needs evaluation and updates before we then uh, turn it out to, to the next round of comment and such. So I'm, I think you're totally in the right direction. Appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So we have quite a few people in the queue and I do see your hands raised. Um, so coming up, we have Director Gipp, then Director Williams, then Director Maurer, then Director Mulvey. So Director Gipp. Sorry about that. I had you muted on my end. <laughs> Thank you. I, just, I assumed it was me as usual. Uh, I will basically reiterate Director Brockett's comments. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely comfortable with this process and uh, reiterating the uh, documentation um, to, so we can kind of see where we've come from historically. I think that's really important to understand, um, but it is my understanding that you are specifically looking at kind of aligning these things rather than revamping areas. And so I think that's exactly what needs to be done. We just were recently redoing a lot of our town code and different areas get things tweaked once in a while and it's good to review these things as a whole and so I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gibb. Uh, so, Director Mauer, please. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Brad. Um, yeah, being a part of Stack and just uh, through the years here and a lot of regional priorities and needs and so I'm glad that we're doing this as well. I think this is important. And I'm, I'm comfortable with the process, but um, uh, just a couple questions. Just wondering, um, would you, would there be like a side committee at all that's part of the board would maybe, you know, be a part of some of the working efforts? Or are you just looking that you come to the board, you know, like on a work, you know, shop and just kind of show us stuff? What do you think, Brad? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm i comfortable with the process that makes the board comfortable is, is, is the short version. But um, as, I, as I mentioned, the board was very involved and formed two ad hoc committees. Uh, okay. The last time we were working on sort of the plan development process, my, my instinct here is that, you know, when we share out a staff in, in March, really what the the headlines of what these changes might look like, um, again, sort of based on it, several directors sort of mentioned this, just that alignment piece, of uh, the things that we know are happening out there that we want to sort of seek alignment on, maybe that will be the thing that sort of sends a signal that we need to spend more time and there needs to be mm -hmm. a, a focus of the board outside of something like the work session uh, to work on that. Um, you know, it's I, I, hate, I hate to presuppose uh, sort of how you all will feel about uh, sort of that crosswalk or what this looks like until you see it. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I like that approach. Um, the other thing is, is, and this will probably be something we'll talk about later, but I was just kind of hoping that perhaps our plan kind of brings about some of where our differences are too. You know, not a big, long discussion, but you know, we do both have, you know, we have a lot of similarities, but then again, we do have some differences. So it kind of be nice to have that kind of noted. Thank you, if Director. Possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next up we have uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brad, yeah, I would echo what other folks have said. You know, I am comfortable with, with y'all proposing amendments and kind of bringing them back to us. My question was more and kind of comes from a perspective of not having been here for the first time with this. Your third bullet there talking about sponsor initiative amendments. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what that entails and what the typical volume would be for that? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Uh, so I, I have been at Dr. Cog 10 years 
Um, I have been through several amendment processes. Um, I, I can think of one example in those 10 years where there has been a sponsor initiate, initiated amendment that came forward that was on a topic other than urban centers, right? That That is the key piece of MetroVision amendments from the sponsor's perspective is this idea that the plan recognizes those, those local uh, urban center priorities uh, in uh, the regional plan. So that is the vast majority of sponsor initiated amendments um, for multiple rounds of the MetroVision plan have really been about uh, the process to review and reflect uh, urban center amendments. But there have been a few cases where there are more like text oriented uh, amendments that come from sponsors. But to give you a sense of order of magnitude, I think we average maybe something like eight to 10 uh, proposed urban center amendments uh, each cycle, and that can be new urban centers and or uh, pretty significant boundary changes. Uh, and there, there, is, there is an actual sort of, um, sort of codified uh, review process that staff follows uh, to review those urban center amendments and to ultimately make a recommendation to the board. Great, thank you. Thank you, Director uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, thank you. I really appreciate the roadmap in particular as a relatively new director. So thank you for that. Um, as my, I have one question, and I'm curious if this is the manner in which it's always been done, because it does seem like a good method. Well, uh, the way that I would just describe it is you know again we we the board is long committed uh to the idea that metro vision is a dynamic plan right so uh in general it's pretty custom that we do something like an annual amendment cycle right that that's where those like urban centers amendments uh get proposed uh this this just feels different um just given again the rtp is a driver unto itself uh, much less all those other key uh, initiatives that, that many of you have have alluded to. Uh, it, it felt like this process needed to be slightly different, which is in many reasons, in many respects, sort of why we wanted to do this check-in uh, with yeah. the board to see if you were seeing this the same way that staff was, so that we could make sure to be on the same page and, and navigate this together. I appreciate that. To weigh in on the questions, um, yeah, I am comfortable with the proposed process. I, I like the idea of splitting it up between the more or less 30,000 view and the, the more granular view later. And then also the degree of documentation. I'm a, I'm a detailed person, so I would appreciate more documentation personally. And then um, with receiving the marked up draft prior to the sponsor initiated amendments, I'm in agreement with that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. So that is all the hands I have in the queue. I'll try to summarize what we've heard so far. So it sounds like everybody's really grateful for the work that's been done to date of staff. And we thank you for that. Um, we're not necessarily looking to redo all the objectives and outcomes, you know, but what we do want to do is get a crosswalk between these new documents that have come out and this new legislation that's come out and, and make updates to our program. And so if you can provide a crosswalk that explains what the new uh, the reason for changing is and how we would want to change that would be fantastic and people are looking forward to staff proposing those changes uh, to the board to consider. Um, if folks have other comments or if I have summarized people's comments incorrectly, go ahead and raise your hand and we can continue discussion. And then the one other thing I would ask for, um, Brad went into great detail about some of the types of documents that are prompting these changes, but if people have other legislation or documents that have come out that they think we have missed to either let us know about those now or to go ahead and email Brad at a later date. So he brought up the greenhouse gas roadmap and some other economic planning changes that have come to the region. But if there are other documents we should be considering, please, please do let us know either now or through email. So I'm not seeing any other hands on. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayne Shaw. Uh, these uh, names are listed alphabetically and it was hidden down there at the bottom. I apologize for that, <laughs> Director Shaw. No problem at all. I, one, one other thing I wanted to highlight, uh, and this came from Director Maurer's comment where, where uh, we kind of echoed uh, Brad's 
recommendation that um, we see the high level first before we delve into additional committees or uh, because we may not need them. So take the, the first look first and, uh, and kind of find out what additional work, if any, is needed offline. Thank you. That's a fantastic suggestion, Director Shaw. And again, I apologize. You were um, missing on my screen. So sorry, I'll <laughs> double check for that next time. Any other comments on this agenda item to this point? All right, seeing that, I'll turn it back over to you, Brad, for any other comments or questions. No, I, I, I'll just say I really appreciate the feedback. This was, this was very uh, helpful. Uh, so again, you will see us in presumably in March uh, at the board work session to have that sort of high level crosswalk organizational uh, uh, high altitude uh, conversation and we'll see where we're at then and then we can sort of further design the process based on sort of initial uh, reactions from directors uh, based on that information. So I look forward to that next conversation. Well, thank you so much. That that takes us to our next order of business today, which is a status update of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan 2050 MVRTP. Jacob Breaker, our Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations, is going to give us a presentation this afternoon. And Jacob, I think you can take it away. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you, and we cannot yet see your presentation, but I'll let you know okay. when we can. Give me just a moment. Sorry, as you noted, this always works before the meeting and not during the meeting. Give me just a second here. It's brilliant. It just, it reminds us all we're all human. Lisa, I may need to ask you to do the same thing for me. My apologies. I'm having trouble navigating to it. No problem. I can do it. Actually, sorry, let me let me try this one thing. Okay. Can folks see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank great. So let's, let's give this a try. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, so Jacob Rieger, uh, Dr. Park staff, along with my colleague Alvin Badal sanchez um, similar to MetroVision, we did want to have a sort of check-in with you on where we're at with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, um, kind of what we're working on now, and particularly what you can expect over the next couple months as we're completing the draft plan uh, and getting it out there for public and stakeholder review. We last checked in with you and had a conversation with you in November and December when you approved what we call the fiscally constrained or the cost feasible um, major project and program investment priorities. Um, that was a major milestone for the foundation of the plan. Um, it was really a gateway from that point to allow us to be able to um, complete the rest of the work to prepare uh, the 2050 uh, transportation plan document. So today we kind of want to you know, continue that story and kind of cover three things uh, that we've been working on since that time. Uh, we'll start with just a little bit on air quality conformity determination um, because that's a big part of the planning process. Um, talk to you a little bit about the draft document and what to expect in the upcoming public comment review period. Um, and then my colleague Alvin uh, will talk you through at a very high level um, our 2050 financial plan, which is also a big part of uh, what's in the regional transportation plan. So starting with air quality conformity, um, a lot of words on this slide that I'm not going to go through in great detail, um, but really I would just kind of summarize this in three ways. I think everyone knows that uh, we are a non-attainment um, area. We do have federal requirements, state requirements around our long-range transportation planning process related uh, to air quality conformity. Uh, we work hand in glove with the uh, RAC, the Regional Air, uh, Regional air Quality Council, um, as well as the Air Quality Control Commission, uh, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, in particular, whenever we um, do an amendment, or in this case, a major update to our regional transportation plan, we are required to do what's called a new air quality conformity determination. And the idea is that if you take all those projects and everything that you approved back in November, December, representing our multimodal transportation plan network, that network of projects, the, the whole program of investments in the regional transportation plan, we need to demonstrate that 
um, that plan as envisioned um, meets our what we call our uh, motor vehicle emissions uh, budgets. Um, so in other words, if the plan um, is not exceeding the budget set for us for air quality conformity, those budgets are set for us in what's known as the state implementation plan uh, for air quality. So when you approved that list of projects and program priorities back in uh, November and December, um, since that time, we've actually been working um, sort of the technical side, the model coding side, and the things that we need to do um, in partnership with the state. It's actually the air pollution control division of the state that does our air quality conformity analysis. The bottom line, as you see at the bottom of, of this slide, is that yes, the 2050 plan um, did pass all emission budget tests. And I should say there will be a lot more detail in the plan uh, once it's released. Um, I want to spend a few slides on the draft document and the public comment review period. Uh, staff has been working furiously. Um, I'm a little upset with Brad that he actually stole the sort of cover slide of the plan. Um, I wanted to unveil that to you, but uh, we've been working very hard to put the draft plan document together. And we're really aiming for several things as we do that. Um, one is that we want the plan to be visually compelling. I think our plans um, have always had really great content or a lot of great information, but we want to be able to tell that story visually just as well as we've been able to tell it narratively. And so we're really working hard on making a plan that really is engaging for all audiences, whether it's you as the board, uh, particularly our public, our many stakeholders. We want people to you know, feel that they can um, you know, have this plan be accessible to them, that they can pick up this plan and get engaged in this plan. Um, as you know, we've done a lot of work together to prepare the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan over the last year and a half. Um, so the plan really should tell that story. There was a lot of you know, local, regional um, collaboration, a lot of people involved in putting this plan together, a lot of work that we did. Um, the plan really should capture that and, and tell that story. Um, there are a lot of federal requirements and, and a larger sort of state and federal framework. Some of that uh, Brad's already touched on and I've already touched on. Um, those pieces are included in the plan as well. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, our plans matter. And I think Brad really emphasized that very well in the Metro Vision Plan. It's the same here in the Regional Transportation Plan. You know, both of these plans set a vision for this region. What do we want to be in this region um, and how do we get there? And so we want the Regional Transportation Plan to work hand in glove with both Metro Vision um, and some of the other plans that Brad and I have talked about um, and really set us up uh, to start implementing the good work that we've done together. Um, as I said, um, we really want this to be a visually compelling plan. So um, it's amazing how much work we've done even since we put this presentation together. Uh, but wanted to show you a couple screenshots of what the plan is starting to look like um, as it comes together. Um, and I really want to credit, there is a whole uh, group of staff, uh, both at Dr. Cog as well as a consultant, helping us put this together. Um, but you know, a lot of people involved that are really making this look like a really fantastic plan. Um, and I wanna recognize their efforts in doing so. I think it's gonna be both an informative plan, uh, but also a really engaging plan when we release it. Um, so we are working uh, furiously to get the draft plan document together. We are aiming to release the plan on February 12th, which is a Friday. Um, and then that launches us into our 30 day public comment review period. The way I characterize this as sort of an easy way to remember is, um, you know, basically the public comment review period will start on Valentine's Day, uh, which is the day that the legal notice will be in the Sunday Denver Post. And our public hearing uh, before you as the board will be on St. Patrick's Day on March 17th. Um, during that 30 day public comment period, uh, we have a whole series of activities lined up, um, both presentations that we're going to make to groups. Um, we're gonna have virtual open houses, uh, we're going to do a variety of uh, online engagement techniques, um, you know, multiple multitude of ways that we want to get people involved um, and get the plan out there so that people feel like they have a chance to meaningfully review and comment um, on this plan. We've also been working on some tools. We'll have an interactive map uh, that will show information about the projects in the plan so that people can understand uh, what these investment priorities are and what it will mean for them. Jacob, we're going to stop right there for just one second and take a question from Director Teal. So um, really, Jacob, I just want to make sure that when the plan is presented to the board on March 17th, that staff does have a beer uh, distribution policy <laughs> in place. We, we will work on that, Director. We'll lean, we'll lean on you for help. As a home brewer, George, we're going to need your help making that happen. Uh, you know, I only got sworn in on January 12th. It's been moving pretty fast. I don't know if I have anything uh, in a carboy right now. 
All right. Well, maybe for the uh, retreat. Thank you, Director T. Any other questions or comments to this point? All right. Thank you. Um, Jacob, if you could continue on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alvin, uh, to talk you through the 2050 financial plan. Alvin? Sorry about that, Alvin. Sorry about <laughs> that. I had you muted. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, we just wanted to bring y'all a holistic view of the financial plan. Y'all have seen some pieces of this throughout the process, but we wanted to show you what that high-level view of the doc of what we're calling the financial plan looks like right now. Uh, while we will be using words like revenues and expenditures, we do want to make clear that the MVRTP isn't a budget document. And it's also not the transportation improvement program or the state transportation improvement program so we're not awarding or programming funds to specific projects it helps set the long-range vision for the region and it's a funding framework for what priority investments we want to make out for the next 30 years you've heard staff being intentional over the over the last year about the projects that we were soliciting evaluating and including in the plan so we wanted to make sure our financial plan was also as intentional so making sure we were making the best available use of limited resources and also finding the best available resources to use to include projects in the plan. There are three parts of our financial plan. There's the revenue forecasts, so our estimates for how much funding we think is available to be spent on the transportation system for the next 30 years. The expenditure categories are where we figure out how much money we think can go towards individual specific line item projects and then what goes to lump sum allocations. Then the last piece is estimated project costs where we start looking at what the cost of a project is and prioritizing what projects can be included in the plan to help use the best use of our limited resources in the region. There are a number of takeaways both for the regional agencies and then overall that we wanted to highlight. For Dr. Cog's funding, we rely on CDOT's program distribution. So that uh, sets the, the vision for the forecast that we're anticipating out for the next 25 to 30 years. We also made an assumption about there being additional regional funding for projects. So we assumed an additional regional funding measure was passed in the region. For CDOT, we, uh, through their program distribution, they assumed a high revenue scenario that would begin in 2025 and go through the plan horizon. And their focus was on implementing their 10-year strategic pipeline of projects. We worked with RTD early on in the financial planning process, but with the impacts of COVID-19, we did get updated numbers from them over the summer, uh, over last summer. So we've also updated their forecast to reflect the impacts they're experiencing due to COVID-19. Uh, similarly, they are prioritizing maintaining and operating the existing system they have over expansion. And then we also developed some forecasts for federal discretionary grants, what we thought could reasonably come to the region over the next 30 years. We also worked with the toll authorities to make sure we were including their projects, their programs, and their investments in our plan. And then when it was specified, we did include project sponsors funding assumptions. We break our revenue down into five areas. Uh, Dr. Cog administered funds is what y'all are most probably familiar with through our transportation improvement program process. So our transportation alternatives funding, our surface transportation block grant funding. This is also where we made an assumption about additional regional funding. CDOT's funding includes uh, state and federal funding. That could be their faster transit, faster safety, faster bridge that's being spent in the region, or some of the federal dollars like highway safety improvement program funds. Oh, Sorry to interrupt, if you'll just pause there for one second, and we'll take a question from Director Brackett. Hey there, thanks, Alvin. Sorry to interrupt there, but I, I was just was curious, you, I noticed this in the packet as well, that you mentioned that CDOT is projecting a, a high revenue forecast, and I'm just wondering what that's based on. Is that in the anticipation of new state funding from the state legislature or something else? Yeah, actually, Director Brockett, I'll answer that um, since I was involved in that work group. The, the notion there sort of philosophically was that um, when we were, so this was about like, you know, a good two years ago when we were at the beginning of this in terms of um, looking at revenue, you know, revenue to be available, anticipated revenue to be available for the planning period. And the notion was that 
you know, within reason, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of different calculations, growth rates and, you know, tax rates and all sorts of things that can go into um, over a 30 year period, how much money do you think you're gonna have available uh, to be able to spend on transportation projects. So working with us and with the other four metropolitan planning organizations in Colorado, uh, we all worked together and we decided, you know, after looking at several scenarios that we wanted the high revenue scenario in terms of, uh, again, this is sort of philosophical because it's a 30 year, uh, 30 year plan, but the notion was that it's, it's easier to include projects in the plan in the front end than it is to try and add them later. And so we wanted the high revenue scenario, again, to be reasonable. The point of the plan is that you are, you are making priorities. You are, at the end of the day, having to choose some things over others because that's what priorities are. Um, but to the extent that it was reasonable, um, wanting the high revenue scenario in order to include as many project priorities as possible on the front end, rather than finding ourselves in a situation of having to constantly amend the plan uh, to include projects later. I don't know if that completely answered your question, but... Um, I mean, I think it does. I mean, we're not making final commitments to these projects at this time, so some some assumptions like that seems reasonable. Just um, looking at our sales tax numbers, uh, high revenue is not what we're looking at for the uh, the next couple of years, but we can all hope. Yeah, understood. And as we've gone through the financial plan, you know, we've tried to calibrate both, you know, recognizing the situation that the world is in right now, but just as Brad talked about earlier, you know, this is a 30-year plan. Um, there are going to be economic cycle ups and downs in that 30 years. It's just unfortunate we're probably experiencing one of the biggest downsides right now. Um, but in the revenue work and the modeling work that CDOT did and that we've done in the financial plan and RTD as well, uh, we've accounted for those up and down economic cycles and trying to be reasonable and conservative in terms of the amount of dollars that we're including. But again, recognizing that over a 30 year time frame, you know, we won't be in this particular situation forever. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you. Um, so on the RTD side of funding, that includes revenues they're expecting through their sales use tax, fare box revenues, and then their FTA formula funds they receive. They're um, historically been the largest of the three funding agencies with funding in the regional transportation plan. The next category are our other regional system funds. So this is funding that can be spent on our regional roadway system. This is where we capture our assumptions for future federal discretionary grants. Uh, this is where toll authority funding is. And then this is where uh, money spent by the locals on new roads for the regional roadway system sits. And then our last court category are the non-regional system funds. So that's everything else being spent that's not on our regional roadway system. This could be new local roads, new minor arterials, new collector roads. This could also be system preservation, operations, maintenance, funding for components that are not part of our regional roadway system. Uh, you can go and skip this next slide, Lisa. So there were, uh, the second piece of that financial plan was looking at how we figured out what went to multimodal capital projects. So those individually listed specific projects and then what went to programmatic investments. Capital projects, uh, if you were to open up our plan, are those individually listed projects in the table. Uh, they include what we've always included, like our new roads, our road widenings, and our rapid transit projects. Uh, but this cycle, it also includes some of our major priority projects that are safety, active transportation, or freight projects. Uh, like I would mentioned, we wanted to be intentional about soliciting and evaluating a diverse range of projects. So we also wanted to be intentional about showing those in the financial plan. The second category are the programmatic investments. So we know there's going to be money spent on local bus service, on sidewalks in the region, but we can't list all those out and we can't map all those, but we know money's going to be spent on categories like that. So this is uh, the high level breakdown of how we figure out what goes to projects and what goes to lump sum allocations. Thank you. We'll take a question from Director Mulvey. Thank you. When um... When you mentioned multimodal and uh, freight, I thought of trains. Is there, is the, I keep thinking of the um, front range passenger rail, is any of that included in this? Or is that always gonna be separate? Director Reeker, do you wanna help us with that? Yeah, I will, I will answer that. So, um, as it stands, um, there's, as, as many of you know, a lot of great work being done on front range passenger rail at this time, but it's not a project for which 
funding has been identified to fully implement the project at this time. So a different way of saying that from a federal, federal lens is it is not a fiscally constrained project at this time. There is not um, a funding source that's been identified to fully implement a front-range passenger rail system. So yes, it is absolutely part of our plan. Um, you'll see that when you see the plan in a couple of weeks in terms of our uh, long-range transportation vision, specifically our, our multimodal transit vision, um, but it is not included in the list of projects that you approved um, in November and December, again, because we don't have funding for it yet today, but it's in the plan as acknowledgement that it's a vision that we're working towards. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next slide, Lisa. So looking at the three regional agencies and how that breakdown uh, looks across their revenue sources. Since Dr. Cog has the most flexibility with funding that's administered by Dr. Cog, uh, staff allocated a significant percentage of that to projects, uh, actual line item specific projects. That includes the, the roadway transit capacity projects, but also those important freight projects, the active transportation and safety projects that y'all approved back in November and December. And then the remainder goes to programmatic investments like our tip set asides and setting up set asides for safety, active transportation, and freight. The other two regional agencies, CDOT and RTE, uh, you can see the majority of their funding is going to programmatic investments. So allocations that we wouldn't show specific line item projects for. Uh, we worked with both CDOT and RTE to figure out what the best balance was for each of their agencies reflecting their, their financial capacity at the moment. And then the third piece for a financial plan is our project costs. So Dr. Cog staff relies on cost estimates provided by project sponsors, whether that's local governments or CDOT or RTD. And the costs are supposed to include all the different phases that get the project being open, either for traffic or for service. Tied with those project costs, we also ask about implementation. So when, when the project sponsor thinks those projects will be open to traffic, will be open for service, and that gets tied into our air quality modeling that Jacob mentioned earlier. That also helps us figure out our fiscal constraint exercise where we make sure that we're not spending more than we think we have available over the next 30 years. And it also helps us make sure that we know that a cost of a project 20 years from now is different than a cost of a project today. So we can reflect that uh, on the ground knowledge that we have. And then providing an example of what that looks like for both revenues and project costs. Uh, when it came to revenues for all of the different sources that we had available, we inflated the money out each year to 2050. Uh, this is an example table that shows just five years of that, of funding that we anticipate being available to Dr. Cog from one of our funding sources. Uh, we combined funding within five year periods. So you can see from 2021 to 2025, we anticipate having 225 million in Dr. Cog's surface transportation block grant funding. That gets tied with our project cost analysis that you can see on the right hand side. So just as we inflate revenues, we also inflate our project costs out. These are inflated to the mid-year in one of those five-year tiers. So in this example, you can see a $100 million project is being included in the plan in 2033. So that means it's a $135 million project by that point, and it uses up the money within the 2031 to 2035 period. So this allows us to make sure that we're not spending more than we think we reasonably anticipate being available. And all of that's just to show that we, uh, the MVRTP is fiscally constrained. So our project costs aren't exceeding our revenues. Uh, we do that exercise in both 2020 dollars and future year of expenditure dollars. Uh, we've been working with CEDA and RTD over the last year, as well as our federal partners and then the toll authorities and local governments to make sure that we've had the best available information uh, for each agency and for each, prog each program for both revenue assumptions and expenditures. And then uh, if there are any other questions, Jacob are happy to take those as well. Thank you so much, great presentation. Are there any members that have uh, any questions, comments? Director Teal. Well, first of all, I'd like to make another pitch for the beer distribution. But beyond that, no, this looks great, guys. I, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I came in and when we were going through the 2040 planning, um, and kind of didn't 
kind of saw this already baked in, um, you know, back in the MVIC days. It, it very interesting. I like seeing the work that you guys are putting in to give us those long range forecasts uh, going into 2050. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, we can certainly have the discussions among the board of, well, you know, where should those numbers be? But I really appreciate you guys doing that work, coming up with that financial model. The way it looks like it's packaged, uh, going back kind of to your earlier part there, Jacob, um, it looks great so far. Um, definitely look forward to uh, seeing it all come together. Thank you. Thank you. Any other directors have questions or comments? All right, seeing none, we thank you so much for the presentation this afternoon and thank look you. forward to seeing that as it continues along. Um, and with that, that concludes our board work session for Wednesday, February 3rd, and look forward to seeing everyone at the board meeting later this month. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good evening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. That was great.